This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. Hello and welcome to WLC Radio. I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright, and thanks very much for tuning in. We've got a very exciting programme planned for you today. Well, at least... I think it's exciting. Uh, It's always thrilling to learn new things from Scripture, especially if what you're learning reveals you've been making a silly assumption and the truth is something very different. Ah, yes, yes, assumptions. Mm. Do you know, they really can get us into trouble, can't they? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, You know William Thompson? Um, Oh, voice actor, played the Mm. part of Peter Pan in the Disney cartoon. Really? Really? Well, I don't know. You're asking me. That's the only (laughs) William Thompson that I know of. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah, I I think we're thinking of two different people here. Uh, The William Thompson I'm referring to uh, was also the first Baron Kelvin. Uh, He was a British engineer, mathematician and physicist. Ah, yes. Now, very influential, actually. In fact, Mm -hmm. I think it was thanks to him that the first transatlantic telegraph cable was installed. Well, yeah, he coined the term kinetic energy and also established absolute zero, the lowest limit of the thermodynamic temperature scale. Ah, yes, of course. Yes, Baron Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature scale. Absolute zero is zero Kelvins. That's right. Absolutely bang on. Uh, You know who I'm talking about now, which is great, but did you also know that uh, it made some spectacular assumptions along the line? Really? Mm. That must be quite unusual for a scientist. I suppose, were they correct assumptions? As a matter of fact, no. Listen to this. He made fun of the idea of radio and said, I quote, are you ready? Radio has no future. (laughs) Right, okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He also said, quote, x-rays will prove to be a hoax. (laughs) A hoax? Mm -hmm. Gosh. Well, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that even the most brilliant minds shouldn't assume. No, 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 none of us should. It reminds me of something the American educator Stephen Covey once said as well. Yeah, what was that? Uh, Well, he said, the least questioned assumptions are often the most questionable. Well, yeah, that's a good point. And let's face it, Christians have made an awful lot of assumptions when it comes Mm. to what Scripture teaches. Oh, have we ever. A couple of weeks ago, you were sharing with me something that just blew my mind. Can you remember, it was an assumption that most Christians make, that is, when you really compare Scripture with Scripture, simply wrong, okay? You really you really shot me with that one. And I'd really like you to talk to us about it today, as we really didn't have a chance to get into when you shared it in passing before. If you ask most Christians what sets Enoch and Elijah apart as special, then what would be the answer there? Well, they were both taken to heaven without seeing death. Right. Well, we've all been taught that since childhood. Enoch and Elijah were translated to heaven without seeing death, and they've been living there ever since. But that is wrong. Enoch and Elijah were not taken to heaven. They died and were buried on earth where they are, even now awaiting the resurrection when Yahushua returns. I know, it's, it's shocking, isn't it, folks? But don't just stop listening. OK, he's right, and he can prove it from Scripture. OK, well, let's just start with Enoch. Could you there turn to Genesis chapter 5 and read verses 21 to 24 for us? Sure. Okay. I've got that here. And it says, And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with Elohim, after he begat Methuselah three hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with Elohim, and he was not, for Elohim took him. Elohim, of course, is a title here that refers to Yahuwah. 
So it seems quite straightforward, doesn't it? Enoch walked with Elohim, and he was not, for Elohim took him. But that does not, contrary to what we've always assumed, mean that Yahweh translated Enoch to heaven without Enoch dying. So I find it fascinating, really do, from this new perspective to note that Moses did not say that Enoch is still walking, present tense, with Yahuwah in heaven. He certainly had the ability to convey that thought, but he didn't. He, he put it in the past tense. Enoch walked with Yah. Past tense. If he were still living at the time Moses wrote Genesis, Moses would not have written about him in the past tense. Yeah, and that's a good point. But you see, there's more. Can you just turn there to John chapter 3 for us and read verse 13? Uh, this is uh, Nicodemus' conversation with Yahushua. Uh, so Yahushua says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Okay, I'm just going to stop you there for a moment. I know some Bibles attribute this statement to Yahushua. But if you look at it, you'll see that this verse is simply a continuation of John's narrative. But how can you tell on that one? Where was Yahushua when he was speaking to Nicodemus? Well, right there beside him. And where was he when John wrote this? In heaven. Ah, yeah, I see. Okay, yeah, no man has ascended to heaven except for the Son of Man, which is in heaven. If it were Yahushua speaking, he wouldn't have said that since he was sitting right there with Nicodemus. Correct. So here we have John the Beloved, and how many people did he say have ascended to heaven? Two, Enoch and Elijah. Three, Enoch, Elijah and Moses. No, he says, no man hath ascended up to heaven. And that's what we call an allness statement. It's all-inclusive, or in this case, all-exclusive. No man hath ascended up to heaven. So that would exclude Enoch and Elijah too. Right. Just look again at Genesis chapter 5, and... This time, just read verse 23. What does that say? And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Notice it says all the days, not just part of the days or the days that he spent on earth, which Moses could easily have put in that caveat. But no, instead he says all the days of Enoch were 365 years. So where did we get this idea that when Moses said Enoch was not for Elohim took him, Moses meant that Enoch was taken to heaven. I don't know for sure, but I would guess that it started with a misunderstanding of the account in Hebrews 11. In fact, why don't you turn there now for us? Mm -hmm. And This is what we like to call the faith chapter, if you'll recall. It starts out with a definition of faith as, quote, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Then it goes through and talks about the different faith warriors listed in the Bible. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Noah did that. By faith, Abraham did the other. Enoch is listed here too. Read verses 5 and 6, please, of Hebrews 11, and let's just talk about it. Okay. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because Yah had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased Yah. Okay, not really sure what you're trying to establish here it says quite clearly that Enoch was translated that he should not see death okay well just hang on a second um you'll see where I'm going with this in a moment so the chapter continues on uh talking about the patriarchs and others Gideon Barak Mm -hmm. Samson David Samuel and so on and then right at the end the author of Hebrews says something which is very interesting just read verses 39 and 40 the last two verses of Hebrews 11 okay and all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Yah, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What's the promise? Eternal life. And yet the author of Hebrews is saying all these, and that includes Enoch, obtained a good testimony through faith, but even so, they've not yet received the promise. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of Yah is eternal life. That's the promise Christians cling to. If Enoch had been taken to heaven without seeing death, Hebrews 11.39 could not say all these did not receive the promise. That's true. So why then does it say Enoch did not see death? Well, remember that scripture teaches there are two deaths. 
This is best illustrated in John chapter 11. Could you just turn there for us? It's the story of Lazarus. Now, you'll remember that when Mary and Martha sent word that their brother Lazarus was very sick, Yahushua replied, what was it? This sickness is not unto death. And then what happened? Lazarus died. But the disciples hadn't received the memo. Uh, Read verses 11 to 14 of John chapter 11. He said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Yahushua spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Yahushua said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. To believers, the death of the body is like sleep. That's the first death, the death of the body. All who die this death, believing in the blood of Yahushua, will be raised back to life. But there's another death, the second death. Let's read about that in Revelation chapter 20. Now here, John is talking about what happens after Yahushua's return. The righteous dead are raised back to life. And verse 4 says, They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But what happens to those not raised in the resurrection of the righteous? Well, read verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now drop down and read verses 11 to 15. This is what happens after the millennium. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before Yahweh, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here we have what John calls the second death. The second death is the literal annihilation of the soul. There is no resurrection from this death. So when Hebrews 11 says that by faith Enoch did not see death, it's not saying that Enoch didn't die physically, because clearly verse 39 says he and everyone else listed in the chapter did die. What Hebrews 11 is saying is that by faith Enoch died the death of the body, but he did not die the second death of soul annihilation because of his faith. Okay, I mean, that makes sense. So what does it mean that Yah translated him? It simply means he carried him. The Greek word from which we get the word translated is metatithemy. Art Gingrich's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament says that the primary meaning of metatithemy is to convey to another place or transfer. It does not mean taken to heaven without seeing death. It simply means to be carried. And this same word is used in Acts chapter 7, where it talks about Jacob and his sons in Egypt. And let's read that, verses 15 and 16. Uh, Acts seven fifteen sixteen. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem, and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Here, metatithemy is translated carried back. So again, it simply means to convey from point A to point B. Oh, like like when Moses died. Deuteronomy 34 says that when Moses died, Yahuwah buried him, and no one knows to this day where he was buried. Exactly. Enoch was a godly man. We don't know how he died. Genesis chapter 6 verse 11 says the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, so it's very possible he may have been murdered. Yahuwah would not allow the body of his beloved child to be desecrated, so he took it conveyed it to a place of safety, and took care of the burial himself. One more verse, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, says that Yahweh hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So if we've been translated into the kingdom of Christ, does that mean that you and I are recording this in heaven? (laughs) I wish. (laughs) So no, we're still here on earth. It simply means that we have been taken from darkness into the light of Yah's kingdom of grace. So basically, Enoch was 
taken or translated from the world by faith, just as Christians by faith are translated into the kingdom of Christ, that we may be in the world, but not of the world. Yes. Right. That does not mean that believers do not die. It simply means that they are, through faith, preserved so that when their bodies die, they will be raised in the first resurrection. You put all the evidence together. John 3 says that no man has ever ascended up to heaven. Hebrews 11, that includes Enoch in the statement that all these faith warriors had died. And it becomes very clear that Enoch is resting in the grave until Yahushua returns. All right, just uh, hold that thought there. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, let's talk about Elijah. Computer technicians, medical personnel, even tradesmen can use jargon that outsiders don't always understand. Christians, too, sling around words that we don't always take the time to actually define. Faith is one word that is used a lot, but rarely defined. The dictionary defines faith as the assent or agreement of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another, resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence. Faith is the judgment that what another states or testifies is indeed the truth, without any other evidence needed. In other words, faith is based on your trust in another person, resting on your knowledge of his character as trustworthy. Faith is essential for anyone living through the closing days of Earth's history, but the really beautiful part? Faith is a gift. That's right. Yahweh loves you so much. He'll even give you the faith you need to overcome. To learn how you can receive the gift of faith, visit worldslastchance.com. We have articles, videos, and even radio programs on this important topic. Don't wait. Yahweh is just waiting to give this precious gift to all who ask him. So we've talked about Enoch, how the Bible or biblical evidence supports that he was not taken to heaven, but that he actually died and Yahuwah buried him just as, centuries later, Yah would bury Moses. What about Elijah then? Because that text in John chapter 3, verse 13, that says, no man hath ascended up to heaven, would have to apply to him too. Yeah, you're right, and it does. And there's even more evidence to prove that Elijah was not taken to heaven than there is for Enoch. In fact, let's start reading the passage that most of us have assumed was about Elijah being taken up to heaven. So could you read it for us? It's found in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Just give me a momento to find it. It really is just verse 11, but there's an important detail in verse 13 that we'll talk about in just a moment. Well, here it is then. It's uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. And it says, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes, and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back, and stood by the bank of Jordan. So Elisha picks up the mantle that had been Elijah's. Now this is important. This was a literal passing of the mantle of leadership. It was a sign that the office Elijah had filled was now Elisha's. Elijah retired, and now it was Elisha's job. Okay, yeah, but where's your proof? Because it says right there in verse 11 that Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Well, remember that there are three different heavens spoken of in Scripture. The third heaven, of course, is where Yahweh has his throne. But if, according to John chapter 3, verse 13, no man had ever ascended up to the third heaven prior to Yahushua's ascension, then, of course, that leaves one of the other two heavens spoken of in Scripture. Okay, right. Well, this might be a new concept for some of our listeners. So just want to take a quick minute or so to just look up the Bible verses that support this idea of there being three different heavens heavens yeah okay. good okay well let's look at hebrews chapter 8 in fact mm-hmm. why don't you read the first five verses there this shows that moses tabernacle in the wilderness was made as a model of the original that is up in the third heaven the heaven of yahweh's throne 
Okay, and it says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The second heaven, then, is the heaven so frequently spoken of in the Psalms, the heavens where there are the planets, the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's what was ordained on the fourth day of creation. So listen to this, Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth. There's Psalm 8 as well, which says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? So again, this is the second heaven. What's the first heaven then? The atmosphere covering the earth. This is used throughout scripture. You've got Genesis chapter 1 open there, so can you just go down and read verse 20? And Elohim said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. When Isaac was pronouncing a blessing upon Jacob, he called upon Yahweh to give him, quote, the dew of heaven. Deuteronomy 33, verse 28, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Right. Now, the only place dew can come from is the atmosphere above us. This is also what proves that the heaven Elijah was taken up into was the first heaven. What did Elijah go up to heaven by? A fiery chariot. Nope. Read it again. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Okay. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, unquote. All right, okay, I, see, I see, I see, I see. So he may well have ridden the chariot that separated him from Elisha, but what actually took Elijah up was a whirlwind. Right. And in right. order to even have a whirlwind, you must have the atmosphere that covers the earth. Elijah was simply taken up into the first heaven. So where did he go then? What, what happened to him? Scripture doesn't say where he was taken. However, as to what happened to him, he just lived out the rest of his life. We would say today that he was enjoying a well-deserved retirement. <laughs> Maybe he had a nice little cottage on the shores of the Mediterranean. Perhaps sipping wine at his fireside after a day of fishing. What? You're looking at me rather sceptically. Well, <laughs> not to sound like a doubting Thomas, but well, how do we know that he didn't just die and Yahuwah buried him like he did with Moses? Yeah, okay, fair question. Well, let's go back and look first at uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. What did the sons of the prophet say to Elisha? It's actually just there in verse 3. Okay, where it says, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that Elohim will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Now read verse 5. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, and said unto him, Knowest thou that Elohim will will take away thy master from thy head today. And he answered, Yea, I know it. 
Hold ye your peace. So first of all, there's nothing in either of these verses that says Elijah was going to die that day, merely that he was going to be removed from being Elisha's head, his, his boss, as we'd say it today. And the symbol of that transfer of leadership, that transfer of holy office, is recorded in verse 13, where Elisha took up the mantle that had fallen from Elijah. Okay, I agree. There's nothing here that says he was going to die that day, and Yahuwah did warn Moses that he was about to die. But absence of proof, as one of my professors used to like to say, does not constitute proof. Is there anything in the Bible to suggest that Elijah continued to live for some time afterwards? Yes, I'm glad that you asked, because it's absolutely fascinating. But you see, if you don't know your timelines, it wouldn't have a lot of meaning, which is why I think most people have missed it. Now, we've been in 2 Kings chapter 2. I'd like you to turn back one chapter to 2 Kings chapter 1, and this obviously occurred prior to Elijah retiring. And can you read verse 17 of 2 Kings chapter 1? It's talking about the wicked King Isaiah. He was king in the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, you remember that he fell out of a second-story window? Mm. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, didn't kill him, uh, but he was badly injured, so he sent some soldiers to inquire of Beelzebub, god of Ekron, if he'd get better. And instead, the messengers met Elijah, who told him to go back because Ahaziah was not going to get better. So, after some back and forths, Elijah himself went to the king. So let's read it, Second Kings chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And Elijah said unto Ahaziah, Thus saith Elohim, forasmuch as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of Elohim, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. Now this can be a little confusing here, so let's just clarify. When Ahaziah died, his brother Jehoram became sole king of Israel because Ahaziah had no son. They had been reigning as co-regents for a while, but now Jehoram remained as sole king of Israel. We know that the first year of Jehoram's reign a sole king of Israel, was 849 to 848 BCE. Now remember that date, it's important. Now at that same time, down in Judah, there were also two kings reigning together, father and son. Good king Jehoshaphat, two years before that, had crowned his son Jehoram as king of Judah. But Jehoshaphat didn't abdicate. They just ruled together, sort of like David and Solomon had done toward the end of David's life. Good King Jehoshaphat died in 845 BCE. So if Elijah disappeared right after Jehoram of Israel began his sole reign in 849 BCE, this was a full four years after Elijah's disappearance. Right, but Elijah was still alive, and we can know he was still alive because he sent a letter. Seriously? Absolutely. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 21 and read verses 1 to 4. Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. And he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, and Jehiel, and Zechariah, and Azariah, and Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. And their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things, with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jehoram, because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword, and divers also of the princes of Israel. Again, this is four years after Elijah's disappearance. Jehoram, with his father dead, kills his six brothers and various other princes in Israel. That's horrible. It is. And when the word of this spread, Elijah, wherever he was living, heard of it. He was so shocked and appalled, he wrote a letter to King Jehoram. And you can read it, Second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 12 to 15. And there came a writing to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of David thy father, because thou hast not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat thy father, nor in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but hast walked in the way of the kings of Israel, 
and hast made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to go a whoring, like to the whoredoms of the house of Ahab, and also hast slain thy brethren of thy father's house, which were better than thyself. Behold, with a great plague will the Lord smite thy people, and thy children, and thy wives, and all thy goods. And thou shalt have great sickness by disease of thy bowels, until thy bowels fall out by reason of the sickness day by day. Well, this is huge. Four years after Elijah was taken by a whirlwind into heaven, Jehoshaphat died, and his son Jehoram killed all of his six brothers. This was so shocking, so appalling, and so evil that even though Elijah was living in retirement, he just couldn't stay silent, and he sent a letter to Jehoram. Now, what's interesting is that some of these events are spoken of in the past tense. So, roughly five years after Elijah disappeared, he sends Jehoram this letter. We know that Jehoram reigned only eight years, after which he died of the sickness Elijah predicted in his letter. Okay, well, one more quick question then, because we're running out of time here. What about the Mount of Transfiguration? Didn't the disciples see a glorified Yahushua standing with Moses and Elijah? Well, what they saw was a vision of future glory. Yahushua himself said so. Let's read Matthew chapter 17, verse 9. These are Yahushua's own words. Now as they came down from the mountain, Yahushua commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Tell no one of the vision. Mm. To say that Moses and Elijah were actually standing there, to say that Enoch and Elijah were taken to heaven, not only contradicts Scripture, but it reads into Scripture what simply isn't there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. Scripture is so clear when you take it just as it reads. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back with our Daily Mailbag. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Both the word of Yahweh and his divine name contain the power that called the universe into existence. That's powerful. This is why scripture repeatedly urges believers to call upon the name of Yahweh. There's power in the Creator's personal name. Satan knows infinite power that is contained in the word and name of Yahweh. He has worked tirelessly to hide the divine name under generic titles. While there is certainly a place for titles, it is a privilege to know and use the Creator's actual name. To learn more about the divine name, as well as the meanings of the Hebrew titles used to refer to Yahweh, visit worldslastchance.com. Look for the article entitled, The Meaning of Elohim, It's Not What You Think. You can also listen to Who or What is Elohim on WLC Radio or YouTube. Visit us today. Time for our daily mailbag. Uh, you know, I really enjoy this part of our program. The questions we get are really interesting and insightful. Often they're questions I would never have thought of. But you know, but you'd what... have wanted to know had you thought of it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, precisely. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, today's question is coming from Craig and Valerie in Ecuador. Did you know that the Galapagos Islands of Ecuador are home to the world's largest tortoise? Oh no, I didn't. How large is large? Well, the Galapagos tortoise weighs over 400 kilos. That's a mere 64 stone, or more than 900 pounds. Wow. Now, that that is um, immense is the only word I can think of. <laughs> yeah, it stands five feet tall, or a <laughs> metre and a half in height. That's taller than some people that I know. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> yeah. amazing. Wow, that conjures up a certain image, doesn't it? Anyway, yep. what's the question for today? Okay, well, they say, we moved to Ecuador last year as missionaries. We're really loving the Ecuadorian people. They are so warm and gracious. Recently, we were invited to a harvest celebration. While we felt honoured to be invited, we also felt a little bit uncomfortable. 
Inti Remi is an Incan celebration of the harvest. While we're all for expressing gratitude for Yah's bounties, this just sounds so heathen, we don't want to cause offence as we've worked hard to show ourselves friendly and be accepted by the locals. On the other hand, we don't want to dishonour Yahuwah either. Any words of wisdom that can direct us in this? Well, first, let me say, I appreciate the sincerity of the motive behind this question. We should always put Yah's honour above everything else. This question touches on how we honour Yah. Do we honour him by joining in or by holding ourselves apart? I don't know. It could be argued either way, Dave. Okay, well, let me phrase it this way. What was a common complaint that the Pharisees levelled against Christ? Well, besides accusing him of being a lawbreaker, I guess. Um, well, they complained that he associated with sinners and he didn't hold himself aloof as they did. Exactly. Yahushua lived to demonstrate the Father's love and acceptance. The way he did that was by loving and accepting those with whom he came into contact. Obviously, a Christian isn't going to join in sacrifices to idols or anything like that. However, a harvest celebration, being thankful for the earth's bounties, I don't think there would be anything wrong with that. Well, it would be an opportunity to demonstrate love and acceptance, wouldn't it? It would also be an opening to witness for Yah as well. And that can only be done when we meet sinners where they're at, like Yahushua did. Holding ourselves aloof will not do that. In fact, there is a Bible verse that I'd like you to read on this subject. James chapter 1, verse 17. So could you get that for us, please? Um, well, just give me a second, just one second. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The God of the harvest is Yahweh, who sends his rain on the just and the unjust, in this, let us follow Yahushua's example. As long as we're not offering things to idols, we can meet people where they are and look for openings to share about the Creator of all. Good point. I like it. It's, it's a balanced perspective. Time for one more question, actually. I don't know where this one's coming from. It just says, quote, Our family is divided on an issue. The teenagers want to wear makeup. The parents say no. It's causing a lot of fights and unhappiness on both sides. Is there any direction you can give us on how to resolve this? Unquote. Uh, well, okay, Solomon, how are you going to divide this baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Well, yeah, it's not an easy question to answer, I must admit. We're a worldwide ministry. I think it's safe to say there will be cultural differences at play here. What's acceptable in one culture isn't necessarily acceptable in another culture, and we shouldn't ignore that. Like Paul explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he became all things to all people so that by all means possible he could save some. So let's have a look at principles. Principles can be widely applied, not just whether or not teens should wear makeup. The principle that motivated Paul was to make whatever sacrifice is necessary to save souls. That should always be our primary motivation too. So you're saying the girls should not wear makeup then? No, I'm not going to say whether they should wear it or not. I'm saying both the teens and the parents should be aware of this principle. Well, if you're going strictly off principles, Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in Yahuwah, for this is right. Yes, and verse 4 says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of Yahuwah. That's repeated in Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, which says, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So what's your answer to the question then? Should women wear makeup? I'm not going to say. This is a personal decision influenced by beliefs and culture. I cannot make that decision for anyone else. I will say that if you live in a culture where it is considered cheap or low class, then it would not be something a Christian woman who wants to reflect Yah in her life would choose to do. For example, take nose rings. In most Western cultures, that is looked down on. But when Eliezer went to Mesopotamia to find a wife for Isaac, what did Eliezer give Rebecca as a gift? Uh, Jewellery. Including a nose ring. Now, I wouldn't want my daughter to wear a nose ring, but it's not as culturally acceptable here. Now, getting back to makeup, I'm not going to say it's a sin for women to wear. 
What if a woman has a disfiguring birthmark or a scar and some makeup will help her feel more confident? Who am I to say it's a sin for her to wear it? I would say, and this is based on my cultural background, that if a woman is going to wear makeup, a more natural look would be more fitting for a Christian than a full on painted mask. But again, that's influenced by my cultural background. Okay, Dave, you're not really giving much of an answer here. <laughs> well, my answer is this simply parents and teenagers should both think about what in the culture presents as Christian and having high standards. An arbitrary rule of no makeup does not necessarily prove a person is a Christian if other areas in her life or the lives of her parents do not also reflect the heavenly values of kindness, compassion for others, forbearance, and a non critical, non judgmental attitude. We are to keep our eyes on Yahweh, not what we perceive to be the failings of fellow believers. I think often there's a double standard too. My American cousins will crack jokes about in their culture having a big rig is seen as masculine, for instance. Uh, hang on. A big rig? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, rig is their word for a lorry, yeah? Oh, or right, as they okay. call it, a large pickup truck, you know? A uh, large lorry can cost tens of thousands of dollars and no one bats an eye because it's seen as masculine. It's the norm in most cultures to celebrate and promote masculinity. I think we need to be careful not to stigmatise as sinful that which is simply feminine or celebrates femininity. The main takeaway is simply this. If you're a parent or a teen, ask yourself this. In my culture, can I wear makeup and still be clearly viewed as a Christian? The second question to ask is, am I equating righteousness with acts of the flesh or by the blood of Yahushua. In other words, am I judging others for wearing makeup in this instance as being less than committed Christians because they choose to wear makeup? That is the more serious issue because what did Yahweh tell Samuel when Samuel thought David's big brother Eliab would make a great king for Israel? Yahweh does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. That is what we're to remember. Yahweh looks at the heart. We can't see the heart, so we tend to judge by appearances, but that itself is a sin, often worse than the sin being judged. Do you know, it reminds me of uh, the Saviour's words in Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, kids, respect your parents. They've been given by Yahweh to train you in the way you should go. Parents, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. They are younger members of the kingdom of heaven. Let kindness be your standard of action, your guide in all things. It's so easy to come up with our own personal definitions of righteousness, but too often those are man-made definitions. There's nothing wrong with being sensitive to and aware of cultural norms. However, never forget that we're saved by grace, not works, and certainly not abstinence. In conclusion, I'd like to read Micah chapter 6, verse 8, and this is the foundational principle that is to guide our lives regardless of cultural differences. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does Yahweh require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your Eloha. This is the principle we must always bear in mind on every issue. If you've got any questions or comments, we'd like to hear from you. Go to our website at worldslastchance.com and click on contact us. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your daily promise from Yah's Word. When the coronavirus outbreak reached South America in early 2020, Ecuador was particularly hard hit. 
the government quickly took measures to limit the spread of the virus. Borders were closed, bus travel was suspended, food stores and pharmacies were the only businesses allowed to remain open. Cars were assigned one day a week to drive based on their license plate number, and a national curfew was imposed from 2 p.m. until 5 a.m. Even national travel was severely restricted. In order to be allowed past military blockades to drive to the next town, it was necessary to provide a government-issued permit, and those weren't easy to obtain. The strictly enforced curfew, along with travel restrictions, quickly resulted in people living in outlying areas running out of food for their families. With everything shut down, they had no way to work, and with public transportation suspended, they had no way to get into markets to buy food, even if they'd had the money. During this time, both the government and citizens alike worked together to get food to those in need. If a family was out of food, they would hang a piece of red cloth, maybe a kerchief or a pillowcase, even a shirt, outside their home. This signaled that they had no food to those who had some to share. As month after month passed, more and more red flags appeared, the need quickly outstripping the ability to provide help. But then something else started happening. White flags started appearing. A friend who lives in southern Ecuador told us of seeing a white flag appear outside one of the poorest homes in his village. In this small four-room home lived three generations of one family, and they had hung out a white flag. You see, a red flag meant the family was out of food and needed help. But a white flag? Well, a white flag meant the family had food to share. One of the poorest homes in the village, and they were letting those in need know that they had food to share. In Matthew 25, Yahushua foretold what would occur upon his return to earth. He said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You don't have to be rich to be a blessing to those around you. You can be Yah's hands to help, His voice to speak words of strength and kindness, and as you do this, you will be blessed in turn. Proverbs 19 verse 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto Yahweh, and that which he hath given, will Yahweh pay him again? We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. You know, today's discussion really reveals the danger of assumptions. We build this entire belief structure on an assumption that's wrong and we don't even know it and that's precisely why no matter how much we've learned no matter how much we think we know we must never stop digging for more there's always more to learn new truths lay a foundation for understanding more advanced truths i know that growing up as a christian i, I heard a lot about the laodicean church the church of the final generation that thinks they are rich and increase with goods and in need of nothing I remember listening to sermons about the dangers of spiritual pride and nodding my head. Oh, yeah, I know, I'm a Laodicean too, yeah. But the very act of acknowledging that I was a Laodicean fed my pride. It made me think I was safe because by agreeing that I was a Laodicean, I was showing that I was a repentant Laodicean. 
right? <laughs> yes, and I know exactly what you're talking about there, actually, Miles. Yeah, the problem is Laodiceans are blind. They don't know what they don't know. This is why we must, each one of us, go to Yahweh just as we are. We must confess that we are blind. We may not see how the Laodicean message applies to us, but we can take it by faith that it does. And we can lay hold of the promises by faith, asking Yahushua to cover us with his robe of righteousness, gifting us with the gold of his faith and love, and anointing our eyes with eye salve. It's crucial that we accept by faith that the Laodicean message applies to us, because, I'll tell you folks, there's a lot more Yahuwah wants to teach us, but he can't if we're all so self-satisfied that we don't think we need to learn anything new. I think another point we need to remember is that Satan builds his lies and his most deceptive delusions on the errors that we cling to. It may not seem all that important a point right now to know that Enoch and Elijah were not taken to heaven without seeing death, as we've always assumed, but guaranteed any point of doctrine that is not in line with the truth, any particular where we've read into it, that what scripture does not actually say, it just opens up to more easily accepting Satan's lies. Yes, you're right. And that's why I believe Yahweh is pouring, literally pouring out truth in these last days. I agree. I agree. Hosea 6 gives us the promise that if we follow on to know Yahweh, we shall know then it says, He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. But where it gets really interesting is when you do a word search for rain in the Bible, you find that Deuteronomy defines rain for us as doctrine. So let me just give you a quick example, just one second. It's Deuteronomy 32. And here is his first two, and it says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. So as we study, we will be taught more truth, that that, that greater truth is the promised later rain. But we have to be willing to study it and, and not dismiss any new ideas as wrong by default, since we already know everything we need to know to be saved. It reminds me of a precious promise in Isaiah 58. Using the imagery of a garden, it promises that if we will follow Yahweh's leading, if we will accept his teaching, then we will be like a bountiful garden. Verses 11 and 12 say, quote, And Yahweh shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones, and thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in." Unquote. Now, isn't that really beautiful? We, each one of us, have the opportunity to cooperate with heaven in spreading the truths for these last days. Yes, absolutely. And it's such an honour and, and a privilege as well. By being willing to study and learn more truth, we can be co-partners with heaven. We can be repairers of the breach. We can be restorers of paths to dwell in. It's such a high calling. It really is. And each and every one of us has our own sphere of influence. Those of you listening at home on your shortwave radio or on YouTube or wherever, Dave and I may not know who and where you are, but Yahuwah does. He has a special work for you to do, a special work only you can do. There are souls in your circle of influence that we can't reach, but you can. Share with your family, your friends. Share with those Yahuwah brings into your life. Time is running out and there are still souls to be saved. We hope you can join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and he is safe to trust. Thank you for listening to this episode on WLC Radio. We're living in very solemn times. The world is hovering on the brink of disaster. Catastrophic events will soon take place that will bring this age to a close and usher in the next. In his great mercy, Yahuwah has revealed through prophecy what the future holds. 
Revelation 8 foretells a series of events, each one worse than the last, that will devastate the earth. The world's food supplies will be decimated. Famine and its accompanying pestilence will result. The earth's fresh water supplies will also be affected. Revelation 9 reveals that demons will impersonate extraterrestrials. The terror and devastation of this so-called alien invasion will make people desperate for safety at any cost. The freedom to live and worship as the conscience dictates will become a thing of the past. For believers, however, there is hope. In describing the end of this age, Yahushua said in Luke 21 verse 28, quote, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Unquote. Yes, the end will be traumatic. It's meant to be. Yahuwah wants to save every individual he can, so he allows this final climax to awaken souls. But the gospel of the kingdom of Yah is that, beyond the traumatic events of the near future, an eternity of bliss awaits all who accept Yah's gift of salvation. When Yahushua returns, all who've died trusting in the merits of the crucified and risen Savior will be raised back to life in the first resurrection. Yahushua will then set up Yah's kingdom on earth. He and the redeemed will reign jointly on the earth for the first thousand years of eternity. John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. If you wish to join with the redeemed of all ages, living a life that measures with the life of Yahuwah, make the choice. Accept salvation today. You don't have to get yourself ready. The truth is, you can't. Neither can I. No one can. Come to Him just as you are. Don't wait until you've quit sinning. You're not going to get better through your own efforts. Accept Yahuwah's invitation to become a member of His eternal earthly kingdom. When you accept this precious invitation, Yahuwah will gift you with a brand new heart. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26, He declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Accepting this priceless gift is the only way for joining His kingdom. Come to Yahuwah just as you are. He's waiting with arms wide open, eager to receive all who come to Him. You have been listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahuwah to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This programme, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahuwah's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.